Hey, AJ Giuliani here, and I'm going to be sharing my 10 predictions for education in 2023. There's two things that I like doing at the end of each calendar year. Number one, I like sharing predictions like this. Number two, I like sharing my failing report, and that'll be my next video and next article that I put out there. But I want to share 10 predictions that I'm seeing from working with schools from around the country, working with educators from all around the globe, from talking with school leaders, parents, students, and also just trying to have a pulse on what's happening big picture in learning, teaching, learning and development, and technology and how things are growing and progressing. So I wanted to start the first prediction by saying that artificial intelligence is going mainstream. I've written about this. I've posted some videos about it. It's not just chat GPT, which I'll show you here in a second. It's all things artificial intelligence. It will be impacting what our students are doing, what our teachers are doing, what our parents are doing, what kind of all of us are doing on a very daily, hourly type of basis. It will be a part of our learning and operating and working very much the same way that a phone or a computer is right now. And when those tools were first created, people thought that it was cheating, right? In the 1970s, calculators were banned for a couple years and then everybody had one in their home and then they were allowed in schools. And so I, I see um, this happening on a lot of different fronts. If you haven't seen chat GPT it's pretty amazing what it can do you can kind of write any question you know um, write and answer or let's just say write an essay on the symbolism in things fall apart now things fall apart is a book that I used to teach it is a heavy book there's a ton of symbolism um, a lot of characters and breadth and if you just type that in there, all of a sudden, here we go. It's hitting the main characters, hitting on the main symbols. Um, these are all things that I would teach as a teacher. These are things that you know a student would really have to dive into the text, go beyond spark notes or cliff notes or anything like that in order to get an answer like is being developed right now. And the craziest part is, if I did this a hundred times, it would give me a hundred variations of what this looked like because it's kind of a, a pattern matching program. And you can use this for anything. It can write scripts. It can answer uh, math problems. It can write lab reports for science. It can do all kinds of things with uh, world and foreign languages. And so there's a lot of different types of things that you can do with chat. GPT, and so that's why I'm, I'm kind of sharing it here. The, the tool is here, but now the accessibility is also here for everyone to be able to use it. So that'd be prediction number one, artificial intelligence goes mainstream. We're starting to see that already, and I think people are having to deal with it. I'm working with a lot of schools right now on what the next step is, right? Um, and how that, how that kind of works, which leads me into prediction number two which is that a lot of the archaic systems that we have will unravel fairly quickly. If you think about things like the admittance essay for college, you could write that in chat GPT really quickly, right? There's, there's some quick tweaks and changes that you could do, but it's pretty easy that some of those systems are gonna unravel really quickly. A lot of the, the homework and writing assignments and things that kids bring home, or maybe if you're in a blended or hybrid or virtual learning program, discussion posts, uh, board responses, all those different types of things can be uh, written and created. And I, I see that a lot of these systems will unravel. I wrote a thread in Twitter about some of the things that I think um, that artificial intelligence will eliminate or completely redefine. And you see things, it's like college or any admissions essay, um, the assign and forget essay when you have writing assignments with students just work at home, um, most homework that are short answer, read and regurgitate, reports of any kind, 
project-based learning that is really recipe-based learning, right? 17 different steps. Most at-home world language assignments requiring teacher lesson plans. Yes, the AI is gonna be able to write lesson plans. It's gonna be able to develop curriculum. It's gonna be able to do a lot of that work, uh, writing, IEP, modifications, different types of things that, yeah, as a human, we'll have to modify and change and adjust, but it will get the heavy lifting done for us um, you know, on the educator side of things. So I think that a lot of those systems will unravel pretty quickly. That being said, if, if we saw anything in the pandemic, and, and one of the uh, colleagues that I worked with at a school in New York, he put it pretty, pretty bluntly in, in saying that, you know, when, when a lot of times we feel attacked, and artificial intelligence will feel like an attack on the established education system, sometimes we go back to those roots of compliance. And I think that there's going to be a lot of archaic practices. We've already seen in schools banning um, chat GPT and other artificial intelligence. You've seen companies coming up with ways to tell if kids have used that or not. And uh, some of the tech director friends and myself, we've been testing it out. It does a pretty good job of recognizing when you've used um, chat GPT, but also, uh, you know, we put some of our work in there that was not written and it said it was you know 70% likely to be artificial intelligence so it has some kinks to be worked out there but I think this this compliance going back to paper and pencil and getting rid of all the phones and technology there will be this year a big shift to people calling for that to happen because anytime a new technology that is really game changing, life changing, definitely system changing is presented, people are going to fight back, especially those people with which the current system works really well for. Them. And you can think about who those people may be. This is lots of different instances of what that looks like. But I think there's going to be a lot of people fighting back and having compliance and there's going to be kind of a you know a pushback right uh, of what that looks like. The book that I am working on right now and I'm finishing up is actually titled Meaningful and Relevant because I truly believe that we're going to have to look at that lens of meaningful and relevant through everything that we do. Meaningful and relevant lesson plans, meaningful and relevant activities, meaningful and relevant assessment, meaningful and relevant. Um, relationships, meaningful and relevant. You can kind of go through design. Everything is going to have to go through that lens in order for it to make sense. Prediction number four, I believe that accessibility is going to be a must-have. I think for anyone's website, anybody's um, presence, and I'm not just talking about schools. Schools, yes, it's a must-have. Anybody who has a blog, anybody who has a website, a business, any of those types of things, accessibility we now have the tools to make accessibility something that can be all over the internet, anywhere that you are um, getting something. And so I've, I've actually partnered with um, Advative, and it's pretty cool here. I want to show you. Uh, they're a nonprofit, uh, do a lot of educational coaching, a lot of different types of things, but they actually um, have this accessibility widget that you can overlay on any type of um, any type of website, any type of platform, if you click it, you see there's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, it is really uh, obviously compliant to all the different types of things. You can click a profile and it immediately changes your website to fit that profile, but then you also can just click specific things here to change what that looks like, right, immediately. Uh, from bigger text to contrast um, to you know all different types of things that you can change to text spacing, uh, dyslexia friendly. There's so many different types of things that you could change uh, and modify on any website uh, just by using this widget. So I've actually uh, partnered with Edvative. I'll, I'll make sure I give everybody a link um, to be able to get this accessibility function on your school website, on your personal website, blog, any of those types of things. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty powerful thing and I think something that we're all going to have to do um, you know, as we move forward. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a big prediction to me. Number five, as a proponent of project-based learning for years and years, 
I really think this is the year that PBL finally has its day. Um, we're seeing with the artificial intelligence coming on, systems changing. We saw with the pandemic and engagement levels dropping and apathy spiking up that there's really been a need to do meaningful and relevant work and authentic work with our students. Um, and then the research is just exploding and making a powerful case for project-based learning. And there's, there's all kinds of research that is out there for students in AP classes and first, second, and third grade students. And I will be sharing this here um, to kind of show what this looks like. A lot of times people have said, well, you have project-based learning, um, you know, doesn't help kids on the test or performing on high level SAT, AP type things. Well, this research just actually crushed it right uh, it boosts science learning in third grade students even across reading levels so people before oh yeah pbl for the gifted students or that type of thing no it doesn't matter what type of student what background um where their reading levels are it raises um, those proficiencies and so um this is just this is just powerful stuff to, to see say that PBL should have its day. Now, I will counter that by saying, um, and this is kind of my prediction number six, this is not going to be without programs trying to box it in. You know, John Spencer and I have been working on developing some project-based learning curriculum for a long time now. And one of the reasons that it's taken us so long is that you don't want it to become just a program where people follow a script. You want it to still have the art of teaching, the craft of facilitating and modifying. You want teachers to have the ability to change things on the fly, see where students are at, and you want it to include student choice, uh, design, inquiry, those different types of things. And so I do think that even though project-based learning may be a big buzzword, a lot of people heading that way, you're going to see the rise of like, there's PBL in a box. And that's not what you want. Um, you really want it to be flexible and adaptable, which is why it works so well. And so uh, I think that's going to be, again, kind of, you know, two budding heads there of, of what that looks like. Anytime we see something take off, it tends to try to be productized, commoditized in terms of, uh, you know, boxing in. You really can't do that with project-based learning. Prediction number seven is that performance tasks will start to replace standards. Um, on the first ever episode of my Backwards podcast, I talked with Jay Mittai. And uh, Jay Mittai is the co-author of Understanding by Design. He is uh, foremost who I think is a curriculum expert and standards expert with his um, you know, UBD framework and all the other work that he's done around uh, performance tasks and designing. And one of the big things that we talked about is that curriculum 3.0 is gonna move away from standards. And we pull up this article that he wrote here, um, that it's, it's time specifically for curriculum mapping 3.0. So he talks in this article about the first uh, form of curriculum mapping, which was diary mapping by teachers. Everybody getting on the same page. Let's talk about you know what I'm teaching, what you're teaching, when you're teaching it. And then curriculum mapping 2.0 is what we've been doing for a while, which is standards-based mapping, common core and all different types of things. It's been, here's the standard, then let's plan everything from that. And I think Jay really believes, and I am right there alongside him, that we are heading into curriculum 3.0, which is gonna be mapping performances, which means performance tasks are going to take over standards as a means for us to identify whether or not students are being successful. And so this does two things. Number one, it gives you a lot of flexibility on what those performance tasks could be. It gives a lot of flexibility on how you complete those performance tasks and how you assess those performance tasks. And with flexibility also comes people who wanna control that narrative and make it very specific. And so there's, again, going to be a battle here. You start to see some of my predictions, there's two sides to all of this. The performance tasks and project-based learning start to kind of be something that a lot more folks are doing, then there's going to be companies and organizations that swoop in 
that try to make it as streamlined as possible. And so we're hopefully trying to fight that a little bit to make sure that it's meaningful and relevant and it's about the people, not the programs. Prediction number eight leads right into that. It is about the people. I believe in working with schools. A lot of the schools that I'm working with, teachers are coming up with great ideas and they're being supported by administrators. And so it's this ground up innovation. Students, community members, people are coming up with great ideas and it's starting to be supported instead of top down, which is a school leader has an idea and then everybody has to follow along. That's much harder to get going. It's, it's much harder. Obviously, you can have a culture of compliance and tell everybody this is what we're doing and everybody just kind of follows those steps. But if you want to be innovative, if you want the learning to be meaningful and relevant, it's that, it's that ground up innovation that's supported and created by the staff and then supported and really made time for and celebrated uh, by the administration and leaders. And I, I see that happening in a lot of different places. Prediction number nine, I really believe personalization is going to come from the adults too. Um, we're going to start moving away from days where professional learning does not include options. It should have options, it should have pathways. Uh, there's lots of those different types of things. One of the things that I've been working on is PD Pass, which is a way for educators to get credits and try a whole lot of different types of things, whether it be courses and online programs or cohort based things or conferences or events and have a pathway. And we're going to see a lot of schools taking this model and saying, yes, this is what we want to do. We want to give our teachers some choice and ownership in their learning in the same way we want to give our students choice and learning because we know if they're not paying attention, they're not engaged, they don't have some agency and ownership, there's probably not going to be a lot that comes on the back end of this. And so I, I see that as personalization for the adults as well. Prediction number 10 is one that you may not think is education um, based, but I think it, it really is. And it's, it's going to impact in a lot of different ways. The creator economy is going to continue to grow. If you don't know what I mean by the creator economy, I mean there's less and less people taking normal nine to five jobs. And there's more and more people doing jobs that are gig based, where they're creating, where they're getting paid for the work that they're doing, um, you know, whatever that work may be. It's design, it's art, it's filmmaking, it's writing, it's all these different types of things. I believe that's gonna to continue to grow. Here's why that's important. As we look at what schools prepare students for, I think a lot of our students already are saying, you know, they don't wanna go that traditional path. So that's gonna impact college. It's gonna impact what we do in high school and therefore it's gonna impact what we do in middle school and elementary school and on down. Because right now, that standard model, like this is how you get into a top university, you have to do X, Y, and Z, that filters down to high school, so we prepare students to do X, Y, and Z, which then filters down to middle school, so we prepare students to be ready to get ready for X, Y, and Z, and so on and so forth. And I think that's gonna change a little bit when the economy is starting to shift in, in major ways that it is right now. And I'm excited for it because I think it gives people a lot of options to pursue things and passions and things that they're interested about. Uh, and it gives people a lot of options to also kind of own uh, what they're doing, whether it's in a job and being entrepreneurial in their job and in their role, like we see from so many teachers and leaders in education space that they're entrepreneurial in their role, or whether they step outside of the role and they're entrepreneurial in that way as well. I think the creator economy is going to help both of those pathways to flourish. Again, I'm AJ Giuliani. Those are my predictions for 2023. I'm most likely wrong, but it's just something I want to put out there. I would love to hear your predictions on the comments on this video. Please share them below. Thanks so much.